Good afternoon, everybody. I want to uh, welcome you to the impacts of CAVs in the public sector session of the PAAV Summit. This is sponsored by Pennsylvania. I am Amber Reimnitz, and I will be moderating today's session. A little about me, I have been involved in the ITS industry as well as with ITS Pennsylvania since 2012 and have been aiding in Pennsylvania's growth in the AV realm for the past few years. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to our fantastic lineup of speakers for this session. A few housekeeping items before we begin. As you are all aware, this session will be recorded and will be available to the attendees later this year. You will also see that your microphones have automatically been muted to reduce background noise, but please feel free to use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen for general conversation and comments and the Q&A section to ask questions about the presentation and upvote the questions you would like to hear answered. This will be a panel discussion following the speaker's presentation, and I will be pulling questions from the Q&A section, so if any questions are posted in the chat, we might miss them. Our first presenter today is Jean Donaldson, Delaware DOT's TMC Operations Manager. Full bios for all of the speakers are available in the Summit program and on the Summit website. I'll turn it over to you, Jean. All right, it appears that Jean's having some technical now. So in uh, to keep this moving forward, we're going to move on and have our next presenter. That is uh, Caitlin Barone. She is a New Jersey DOT principal traffic engineer. Caitlin? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so, as mentioned, I am a principal engineer for DOT. Um, I work for the mobility unit, and we specialize in uh, the maintenance and monitoring of adaptive signal systems. So today I'll be talking to you about the NJDOT's Connected Vehicle Program Workforce Development Initiatives. A quick presentation overview. I will go through our CV program background, uh, our workforce development initiatives, including our connected vehicle knowledge transfer rollout, some of our training modules and equipment training that we've implemented, and our future initiatives. And then I know we'll have time for questions. So for some of our previous CV initiatives, we developed a concept of operations to begin to learn what connected vehicle applications were relevant to each specific stakeholder uh, throughout the state. The NJDOT led the New Jersey Transportation Agency Partnership or NJTAP uh, CAV working group. In this group, a strategic plan was created to outline what we hope to accomplish and overcome on the road to CAV implementation in New Jersey. And last but not least, the New Jersey Connected Technology Implementation Initiative, or NJCTII project, which you'll be hearing a lot about from me today. Uh, this project entailed evaluating CV data in a controlled lab environment and ultimately led to the deployment of both DSRC and CV to X RSUs at five signalized intersections across the state. Currently, the NJCTII project team uh, is testing more RSU applications, such as the pedestrian and signalized crosswalk and pedestrian collision warning at signalized intersections. We also have uh, ongoing construction projects, including US 4322 in South Jersey, which has 48 RSUs being deployed at both intersections and mid-block locations. And on I-295 and US 1, we have 78 RSUs being deployed once again at both intersections and mid-block locations with a few wrong-way driving locations as well. We also employ consultants. So we have two consultants for our smart and connected corridor design services and two contracted for connected vehicle conceptual design services. 
So with all of these ongoing and future projects, the NJDOT knew that we needed to get training underway for our workforce. Uh, so we built our training right into the existing CV program initiatives. For the NJCTII project, we had a, a training module developed by project stakeholders and partners, and we also worked with Cisco and had them create a knowledge transfer of their systems and services for us to better understand. I will get a bit more in depth uh, with each of, each of these trainings in a bit. Uh, as I mentioned, our construction projects, for those, we built the training right into the contracts. And finally, we are coordinating with the NJDOT operations unit to get training out to all sectors of the DOT. So the project team for NJCTII is in the process of developing and scheduling training modules for all NJDOT staff. Module one is the very basics of CV technology. What is an RSU? What is an OBU? And how do they work together at an intersection? Modules two and three are Cisco based and explain the RSU and controller hardware configuration, testing and implementation in the field. Module four will focus on OBU training. Module five is another Cisco knowledge transfer covering their edge intelligence and applications that they've created and implemented in our project. Module six goes into our SCATS adaptive system that we use to monitor and maintain many of our signals across the state and how SCATS will be programmed to work with RSUs. Module seven is training for wrong way driving systems. Module eight is specific to our construction contracts, which I will go into later and covers commander controller training. And finally, module nine will cover SCMS training, which is the security aspect of the project. For the NJCTII project, we included the training sessions right in the overall scope of services. Specifically, Cisco's scope included 20 one hour knowledge transfer sessions for the NJDOT staff to learn the CV system tested both in the lab and deployed in the field. In order for all applicable NJDOT staff to receive the information they needed, we structured the knowledge transfer as such. A high level overview of CV for the, uh, for the operations and electrical units, training on actual configuration, deployment, and integration, and for the maintenance units of the DOT, general maintenance and lessons learned. And now for a more in-depth look at these knowledge transfers. For a very high level overview of the connected vehicles, uh, Cisco will cover CAV and applications, an overview of SCMS, as I mentioned before, which is Security Credentials Management System, an overview of the, uh, the NJDOT user, acts, I'm sorry, an overview of the NJDOT CV data management portal interface, as well as how NJDOT users will gain access to the interface. And finally, map messages, which are basically the geometry and layout of each intersection. The operations unit will learn about equipment setup and configuration, Cisco's edge intelligence platform, SPAT, which is signal phase and timing, MAP and TIM message development and deployment, and SCMS enabling features, so how we get that all set up. And finally, the maintenance units will learn about troubleshooting for both our hardware and software, technical issue escalation management, so where do we go if we have a problem, and future impacts and updates for projects, such as geometry updates and map updates. We are using vendor-specific training for these projects because these brands of electronics implemented in the field may have different use cases than other brands that we might use in our test pilot or lab scenarios. For RSUs, OBUs, traffic signal controllers, our wrong way driving systems and equipment and CAV hardware systems.
The NJDOT plans to utilize the operations training unit to help facilitate all the training to NJDOT staff from various units. They will ensure uh, that recordings of the training modules and knowledge transfers are available to staff that could not attend live. They will develop policies and procedures manuals, and they will be in charge of purchasing extra pieces of equipment that we use on our CAV projects for future hands-on trainings. So some of our future initiatives. The NJDOT has a specific AV strategic plan, and we are developing a programmatic approach for deployment of wrong-way driving and pedestrian applications. And those are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the uses of RSU interaction at intersections. We have conceptual and final design packages for CV deployments to continue, which is why we know that training is imperative for all units of the DOT. And finally, we plan to expand on our existing lab, as well as the possibility of creating new lab environments through the training unit for farther reaching in-depth training of NJDOT staff from all units. That is all I have for you today. Thank you for your time. And if you have any further questions after today, uh, we have Wasif Mirza is our contact at the DOT and Kevin Hayes is our contact at Jacobs. Thank you so much, Caitlin. As a reminder, if you have any questions regarding Caitlin's presentation, you can add them into the Q&A section of the Remo platform. Now I'd like to continue on with our second presenter, Nathan Skaroki, excuse me, Skaroki with the MA Commission of the Blinds Regional Director. Hi. My name is Nathan Skaroki and I am from the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick here. All right, and hopefully everyone can see this. All right, and we're gonna look at the impact that autonomous vehicles uh, could have on vocational rehabilitation outcomes uh, for our clients at the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. Uh, we worked in partnership with Jacobs. Um, so the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. We can't see your screen. Oh, you can't? Cannot. Thank you. Try this again. How about now? Yes. All right. Let's see. So it's from the beginning. All right. Good to go? Yes. Great. Thank you. So the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind is a state agency under the Executive Office of Health and Human Services in Massachusetts. Uh, we serve 27,000 legally blind uh, people. That's how many people we have registered currently with us at MCB. Um, so what does it mean to be legally blind if you are 20 over 200 and your best corrected uh, vision eye, that means with glasses or any other aid, you are considered legally blind? Um, it is state law in Massachusetts if uh, a doctor declares that you are legally blind, that you are registered with our agency. Um, we have different tracks. We have vocational tracks and social service tracks. Um, our primary goal is rehabilitation and independence with our clients. So why is somebody from the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind at this conference? Um, and why we wanted to request um, some help understanding the development of autonomous vehicles uh, for reasons of access to transportation uh, can be a major barrier for people with visual impairments. Uh, public transportation in rural areas in Massachusetts is limited if, or just not available. Um, and to better understand the current public transportation system and understand the current labor market in our state to better prepare our clients uh, for work down the line. So we put out an RFR 
uh, for requests for this. And that's where we connected with, with Jacobs. So we took a look at a few things. Um, we wanted to investigate how the advent of AV could positively affect employment outcomes uh, for blind people and what to do next. And that's looking at the social piece, support the under, um, underserved blind population, further positively affect other man driver decisions and behavior, the economic piece, support economic growth through jobs created, um, enhance safety for blind and visually impaired travelers and pedestrians, um, enhance operational efficiencies uh, for transportation agencies to decrease the cost per ride. One of the major concerns for people um, that are coming um, in contact with autonomous vehicles uh, is being able to hear them. So just electric cars in general, never mind autonomous vehicles without a driver, um, it's hard to hear them. So for people with visual impairments crossing streets or interacting in parking lots or those type of things, um, they wanted to make sure that some of these things uh, are known and addressed during uh, as things develop with, with AV. Um, Want to determine the location of known MCB service cases, their respective location and desired job placement, extract which employers were committed to hiring blind persons to produce a list of potential employers in Massachusetts, their location and job category. We wanted to assess the current transit network, uh, TNC and AV transportation partnerships, including the market survey, and develop recommendations moving forward to continue this effort and not limit the progress of the project to this report. Some of the things we found. Um, the largest growing sector in most regions in the Commonwealth uh, and potentially most exciting to make connections with moving forward is healthcare and social services. Um, Massachusetts has a number of hospitals um, and social service agencies across the state. Um, and there was a lot of opportunity for folks there. Uh, statewide on average, one in six MCB clients, 18.9% uh, of them employment goals were aligned with priority industries in their local regions. Um, which shows really the need for transportation to uh, let people get to the jobs that they're looking to get into. Um, there is a gap of opportunity for MCB consumers due to the lack of available transportation in parts of Massachusetts. Um, the Cape region, um, the Western Mass region are, are very rural um, in comparison. There's very limited uh, public transportation available, Uber, Lyft, and um, other types of uh, ride shares aren't available. And, you know, the advent of AV in the future would really provide a level of independence that would, would be great. Um, AV will also be beneficial beyond work. Uh, you know, it's not just getting people to work, it, people with visual disabilities to voting, medical appointments, uh, banking. Uh, there's so many applications that can benefit blind and visually impaired people or just any disability. Um, unfortunately, the most recent OEM estimates that we're looking at 2045, 2050 timeframe for an all weather, all road uh, traffic capable vehicle meeting AV level five standards. So that is a little discouraging and especially when sharing this information. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about what needs to be done about that. We're at a critical time to support mobility for all. We can work towards transportation equality through policy, technology, advocacy, advocacy and education. Um, we can partner with other disability populations to help form accessibility solutions, um, connect with industry leaders to provide accessibility recommend, recommendations. Um, one of the things with not being here into 2045, 2050 is we have a lot of things to solve between now and then and really take advantage of what technology is available in things like Uber and Lyft and have them be part of, um, you know, the solution. Uh, one of the things that we run into is, you know, sometimes public transportation or Uber or Lyft or other uh, transportation opportunities, they might see one of our clients with a guide dog and not let them in. Um, you know, part of it is educating them on, on what the laws are and, and, and making sure that these types of transportations are reliable to our clients and consumers. Um, and we really want to be part of going forward, making sure that AV is accessible for everybody. Um, understanding the technology, um, 
finding gaps and accessibility and communicating that is what's important to us now going forward. We really want to be part of those conversations. We, um, in sharing this information with others in our networks, they want to be part of the conversation um, because down the line, AV will provide so much more independence for our consumers, um, whether it, they're in a rural setting or a urban setting, even the people in the urban setting that have access to public transportation and are able to uh, take advantage of that, having the independence of not worrying about timing and, um, you know, cancellations and those type of things will be great. Um, and then in the uh, more rural settings, just having the ability to jump in a car and go where they need to do without setting up a ride with somebody or not having public transportation, the level of independence is uh, very exciting for our consumers. It's a topic that when we do, when it does come up, um, you know, everybody kind of sits up in their chair and, and takes notice and, and wants to be part of getting us to that point where they can take advantage of it. All right. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan, for your presentation. And again, if you had any questions uh, for, for Nathan, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to them after our last presenter. So I'd like to introduce Gene Donaldson, the TMC manager at the Delaware Department of Transportation. All right, Gene, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. All right, thank you, and sorry about the start-off problem, but uh, let's try to go forward here. I'm going to be speaking about Delaware's uh, automated vehicle shuttle program, and uh, and a little background uh, about where we're at and where we're going. All right, uh, a little background is uh, Del, Del Dot's integrated transportation management system. I manage the program. And as indicated, it's a uh, provides a robust foundation for innovation built on uh, telecommunications and a very adaptable system. Plus, we're working on an AI project at the moment. Uh, it'll be a two to three year project. Critical functions, um, I try to simplify all of this, is we're monitoring, doing control, and providing information on a 24-hour continuous basis. In 1997, when I first came to Del Dot, uh, we created the um, Integrated Transportation Management Strategic Plan that defined uh, what we would do as a Department of Transportation. If you're not familiar with Del Dot, we are multimodal and over 90% of the roads in Delaware are our responsibility, is Del Dot's responsibility. So in uh, 2017, we uh, did an update to the strategic plan. Uh, it addresses the emerging technologies, uh, the telecommunications network that was necessary to move forward, uh, and uh, transit integration and uh, Del Dot uh, mobile applications, but also laid the foundation for us to start understanding automated vehicles. So we, uh, we started on a shuttle program uh, and mainly the, the program is, our goals are to demonstrate AV technology, educate and training of the Del Dot uh, workforce, allow public to experience AVs and expand knowledge and acceptance of AVs as a transportation alternative. Uh, learn, and, learn how AV technology interacts with other vehicles and modes and learn how AV technology interacts with the transportation management system that uh, I let off with. The, when we uh, uh, 
decided to advertise and put out a, uh, a bid for uh, AV shuttles. Uh, originally, uh, we, we were working with the University of Delaware to lay out a program up there for a variety of issues. That did not happen, but actually it helped us because it gave us an opportunity to work on the ABs, uh, the shuttles uh, within Dell Dot as we learn more about it. We had uh, to put the specs together. We coordinated with other uh, agencies that are already working with AV shuttles. We developed the specifications and uh, we also made a decision that we wanted to own and operate versus just leasing and uh, posted the RFP in 2018 and awarded in 2019. Our selection was Easy Mile and the Easy 10 vehicle. And uh, I won't go through all the, the pieces there, but uh, we decided uh, once uh, we obtained the vehicles and worked with Easy Mile, we developed and we made a decision, well, let's just use uh, the Dell Dot campus and uh, what you see in the, the map on the screen, uh, that's uh, Dell Dot's headquarters in Dover with a variety of our support maintenance facilities and so on. That is a public use roadway going through the middle. So we did uh, start testing and, and driving the shuttles on public use roads. And so when they're out in this, uh, the blue areas, uh, they are with traffic from day one when we uh, started to use them. Uh, we've learned a lot and how they adapt to anything that's uh, in their field of view, uh, pedestrians, and also in that route is a roundabout, which is one of the more difficult I went to, to move and so forth. So testing and acceptance started, it uh, was in March of 2020. Uh, if you all remember the dates, uh, we were doing, I was, uh, we were doing the final acceptance testing when a call came in indicating that the governor was going to do the lockdown the next day. So that changed things of how we were going to move forward. Um, Testing and validation plan based on our on the RFP, daytime and nighttime operations we tested. We traveled the full route and uh, did a pretty good uh, testing of the vehicles. We also tested driving bikes in front of them, uh, putting bags to uh, simulate a small child and so forth just to understand how it would respond. Storing and charging is uh, all done at Dell Dot facilities. Uh, the other thing is the uh, our maintenance people for DART, which is our transit agency, um, they are learning how to maintain the shuttles. So we one of the things though we're finding out is we solicited volunteers to learn how to, to operate the shuttles. Uh, that was challenging because of other workloads and responsibilities. We do now have a pretty good team for shuttling, uh, for sh operators. Uh, COVID, as I said, had an impact and the learning curve of new technology. And definitely you have to stay alert when you're operating one of these things. So <clears throat> that's my contact information and I'll be glad to answer questions uh, when that happens. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Jean. And that now concludes all of our presentations. So if you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A section. Um, at this time, I would like the speakers to turn on their cameras and microphones, and we will begin with some Q&A. All right, wonderful. Well, we've definitely learned from you guys that, and, and it's known, but again, that the connected 
autonomous vehicles are going to have a very vast impact on how public travels and that we can't just look at anything in our industry as, you know, as one little silo. It's going to trickle down and affect everything. You know, we heard from Caitlin about the value and importance of workforce training that New Jersey DOT is working on because you have to be able to understand the product that you're, you're working with. And then we had Nate talking about the accessibility that this technology is going to bring to an underserved community and how vast that underserved community is across you know, the country. And then Jean brought in all the work as an agency on what they're doing to actually make all of this a reality. And that is not just a simple send that bus out. There are so many things that you have to look into. So one of the questions I wanted to bring up first came from the audience. Uh, it was directed to you, Caitlin. And they were wondering, are there any thoughts of using AVs for public transit in a dedicated lane on New Jersey highways? That is a great question, Seth. Thank you. Um, while it's not in, it's not projected at the moment, uh, I could definitely see it happening in the future. Um, we've had talks um, with other companies about eventually implementing um, priority transit signal or tra sorry, transit signal priority for um, emergency vehicles would probably be first, um, ambulances, fire trucks, things like that. Um, and then after, shortly after that, I think public transit would be next. So I think it's definitely feasible in the future once we get our bearings straight with how all of this RSU technology can work together at an intersection. I'd actually like to throw that question also over to Gene to see his thoughts as it's related to Delaware. All right, help me, remind me of the question again so I don't screw up here. So it's, it's all right, it's thoughts of using AVs for public transit in a dedicated lane on Delaware highways. Well, right now the, the status of the vehicle, at least the shuttles we have only do eight to 15 miles an hour. We've made a determination that's not fast enough to have it with traffic uh, in a place not where we already have testing going on. So uh, as the, what we've learned, that's what I'm saying, that's why we have them, is as AV technology progresses and they can uh, more normally fit in with traffic, then yes, we would do that. Perfect. All right, I had another question come in here for, this is for Nathan. Do you see AVs helping the rural communities as a private hire type business or working with the state DOT to help people get where they need? I think there's an opportunity for both. Um, you know, if you ask my clients the what they would want is their own vehicles eventually, and, and we know that's so far down the line, but right. So maybe having um, the DOT's help with the purchase of vehicles and, and creating some sort of schedule or uh, private businesses, um, you know, getting them themselves and, and using them to get people back and forth to work would be great. Um, I see both as an opportunity and, and anything that would eliminate that barrier of transportation, especially for folks in the rural areas would be, you know, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, thank you. All right, this one is for you, Gene. Question and statement is, once the shuttle is deemed successful at the Delaware DOT's campus, does Del Dot then have an area it would like to deploy an easy mile shuttle or is that still to be determined? In fact, we have a meeting coming up uh, to uh, start working on that. Uh, we are back in uh, looking at the University of Delaware. Uh, there's a new portion of the campus that has, uh, there's a train station there. And then there's a new development of high rises and uh, a variety of new businesses that we feel is uh, a good option for the way the shuttles can operate right now. 
And so that's one of the places we'll be looking at. But our goal is to uh, to get it out there so people can see it and use it and so forth. But it has, to, like I said, it has to be in the right environment. Absolutely, we need to really instill trust uh, in this technology as well from from the public. All right. This next question is geared towards Caitlin and Jean. So yesterday, the speaker from Colorado DOT stated that they are using a driverless TMA vehicle behind their paint trucks. Do you guys know if your respective agencies are using anything similar? Uh, I'll go first. Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe we're using anything like that right now. Um, I don't work as closely with the operations unit, so it's possible that there's something I don't know about. However, I can say that um, we are in the process of getting onboard units on our some of our state vehicles. So we are working towards getting them connected with our smart technology out of the intersections and on highways. All right, I'll add that um, as was brought up, uh, we we are testing our issues at uh, like 20 some intersections. I stopped it there because of the change of uh, technology. We're replacing with dual mode units. For the part about the automated, um, uh, basically um, to, for the construction vehicles, we have been contacted. We've looked at uh, the technology. At this point, we have not made a decision on it. All right, I will put this one to the group, if you guys know this. Uh, what are the standards for noise emissions for the visually impaired? I apologize. This goes to Nathan. So, sorry. What are the standards for noise emissions for visually handicapped? Is And, and then what organization or agency created those? I'm not sure what the standards are. Um, the concerns that have gotten back to me is just to be able to hear them. Um, because there was some interactions where, you know, people had difficulty um, knowing that they were there. Um, I know there was something passed, and I, I don't remember the name of uh, who, who passed it, but I know it was a nationwide um, mandate that if vehicles were um, traveling 15 miles or under, they did have to produce some sort of noise emission. Um, I don't know what that level is um, that makes it um appropriate for people to hear but um i know there's something out there now uh for the electric vehicles absolutely thank you all right gene this one is for you in addition what are some of the factors that dell dot is taking into consideration to determine such area and that is regarding where you would deploy the av shuttle I think it's a variety of factors, some of which I've mentioned. It's uh, it's you the technology gets keeps getting better, and we've worked closely with Easy Mile, um, so we're going to be very careful uh, how we integrate it into traffic. But it is already running with traffic and does pretty good. Um, the speed thing bothers me, as I mentioned. And, uh, and then you need the support of operators. You still have to have an operator with the vehicle. Uh, we still are working with NHTSA because of an earlier incident with an easy mile vehicle. So we have to get uh, more, uh, we have to get approval from NHTSA anytime we adjust the route for our shuttles. So there's a variety of factors and uh, uh, I think all of those will, over time, uh, we'll be able to implement more readily. Thank you. This one goes to Nathan. Yesterday, a panelist from Cruz spoke about creating ADA accessible AVs. Does the Commission for the Blind work close with any companies to develop standards or policy in AVs? 
that's our goal. We we don't currently, and I, I almost uh, definitely reach out to uh, find out who that person from Cruz was to to talk to them. Um, we are actually in the process now of creating a um, an advocacy group that uh, will be able to reach out to people and to give input um, where they're seeking it and to hopefully help um, think about some of the accessibility issues and, and some of the needs of people with visual impairments and other disabilities as well. We don't want to limit it to people with visual impairments. We want to think about other disabilities and bring them into the conversation. Um, and then our next step is reaching out. So I appreciate that com uh, that question and I will reach out to that panelist. I appreciate that. Thank you. Caitlin, does New Jersey DOT have any plans to share its training modules, practices with other stakeholders or agencies within New Jersey? Uh, yeah, I believe we do. As I mentioned, our training unit will be recording um, all of our training sessions for future use. So even if we can't organize specific trainings with these other agencies and stakeholders, we will have the recorded sessions to be able to share with other uh, parties. And adding on to that, do you anticipate the need to have refresher trainings due to the changing of this technology and the products that we're utilizing too? successfully connect with them? Yeah, I would say definitely. Um, as you said, the technology will always be changing um, and improving, which is great, but it will definitely require refresher courses. Um, and I think, you know, as we have new staff come in, we'll get them trained so we can have previous staff that was already trained just hop right in on those. Thank you. All right, again, if you guys have any questions that come to mind, please continue throwing them into the Q&A. Uh, we've actually gone through all of them right now from the audience. So again, thank you, everybody. I do have some additional questions, though, that I will ask the panelists. Actually, let me refrain as we go back to the Q&A. All right, this is for everybody. Are there any notable milestones your department would like to reach in the next five years related to AVs. We start with, uh, you want to start with Nate and then go around the horn? Sure. For for us, it, it's it's educating partners um, about AV um, so they understand where the technology is and what to expect and, and all the wonderful things that it's going to provide in the future. But it's also solving some of the gaps that it will take care of in the long run between now and then in, in, in working to um, meet transportation transportation needs and, and, and workforce needs between now and then and how do we and how do we better work with folks like we were talking before to make sure they understand the accessibility needs of our clients and other people with disabilities. Caitlin? Um, so within the next five years, it's kind of tough to say with this kind of stuff because it's so new to us in New Jersey. Um, we, now that we've gotten going on it, things are starting to move a lot faster. So I'd like to think that five years from now, we could be very technologically advanced. Um, and again, that depends on what kind of, uh, automated vehicles are released by then because then we'll have the technology to work with them. Um, but I think we would definitely like to see the transit signal priority coming out um, after we get the RSUs and OBUs configured. Wonderful. And Gene. Well, I, let me uh, just uh, back up with some initial steps we took is uh, we have an advisory council for AVs and the committee that has legislators. It has a variety of individuals on it, the secretary of transportation and so on. We also looked at our legislation. If you want to come uh, operate an AV vehicle in Delaware, we have no laws against it. And so also because we have this dedicated program, the ITMS program, which continuously enhances our transportation system, including transit is integrated into it. 
that as technology, we've laid down the institutional framework, uh, the legislative framework, all of those things you need to have to advance. So um, we've just adapted to whatever the next thing comes along. And we want to make Delaware a place you can come do it. Adaptable, that is that is a great way to define how our industry has to be with this technology. Okay. How have the efforts noted in your presentations impacted the future planning for CAVs in your respective agencies? I'm going to start with Jean this time. Well, as we since we have uh, planning is a big part of uh, everything we do, uh, we've integrated the ITMS program with planning, and so um, it is the department's program, and so. All of our plans for future transportation related uh, activities from roads to transit, uh, so on, is part of, uh, that's why we have the Integrated Transportation Management Strategic Plan. It is the whole department and it's our agencies outside of the department. All right. Thank you. Caitlin? Uh, yes, to branch off of what you were saying, planning is key. So uh, I believe that our current initiatives and projects are leading to future construction projects that will have RSU technology and CAV technology already incorporated into their scopes. So it won't be a new thing anymore. Um, we'll just be expecting to put a construction project into effect with all of that technology already implemented. Thank you. And Nathan. Uh, for us, it's understanding areas that it will impact the most um, in, in making those connections um, to make sure the accessibility is being thought of. It's also really thinking about how they're going to help in, in ways beyond just the workforce um, in everyday life of our consumers. Um, and it's educating people, too. So it's educating um legislators and and uh, uh, politicians and other um people that have sway on on making sure that these can be on the roads in the future and and will when they are available and ready to go can make the impact where they need to to make that impact so th i think that's a big piece of the planning going forward too is is just the education absolutely amber, amber if i can i'd like to add to what caitlin said absolutely is that um, with the plan, the strategic plan, what we do is every capital transportation project is reviewed by my section. So for the last 20 some years, every project that's built has the technology included. In, and especially the, the fiber optics or the ductwork, the telecommunications plant that's necessary to support all this stuff. So it has to be part of the planning from the vision on through. And so that's the way we're doing business. Absolutely. And you, you struck on a good point, Gene, noting that we're all thinking about, you know, what's going on above the roadway, at the roadway but yet you also need to think about what needs to go below the roadway. How are you doing that communication that needs to always be there and plan for something that falls within another construction project and the value of planning for this technology. Thank you guys again. A couple more questions have come in. Uh, this is for Nathan. Sometimes the adoption of new technology scares people from trying it and can hinder advancement. Do you see differences between your clients and people who drive every day? Uh, yes. Uh, my, the, when I bring this uh, topic up, uh, clients of ours are, you know, they're raising their hands and, and volunteering for any way they can to help advance AV and to get it to the point where they can take advantage of it. Um, I think the, you know, the part of scaring people is the people that are already on the road and, and someone who um, 
isn't used to having an AV vehicle next to them or operating next to them, I think that might scare everyday drivers. But as far as our clients go and uh, the opportunity to be able to have that um, that freedom and that independence very much outweighs any any piece of being scared of getting in one of them. I don't, you know, I think uh, most of, if not all, would, would jump into one right now if, if it would mean um, that level of independence for them. Uh, I, I, I can completely see that not being bound by others to get you where you need to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I will throw this one back at you and then it might as well for Gina Caitlin, but what has been the feedback from the user workforce based on the deployment so far? um the feedback so far is just excitement for us um you know there's there hasn't been much deployment in in our area as of now um but when we talk about the opportunities that it would present or you know the success where they maybe have deployed on private campuses or in other areas and in, in the success that they've had it, it, it provides a lot of excitement and uh a buzz around the topic uh we do a podcast and, and uh our most popular podcast is when jacobs came out and talked about av that's the one that has the most views to just give you an example sounds like you might need a series about it All right <laughs> so taking that question caitlin for you uh on the idea of training staff you know, have you had any feedback from people who have gone through the training or just that education internally at NJDOT with what you guys are doing and getting that internal buy-in? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I know, as I explained, we had the whole list of modules and knowledge transfer sessions. Um, we've held a few of those so far. There's still more to come, but from the ones we've had, we've gotten very good feedback so far. Um, and all of the NJDOT employees that attended have asked for more trainings. Um, as we know, there will be more CADV deployments in the future. Uh, and as far as our actual deployment goes, the, the project team that's gotten to see this act actually implemented in the lab in the field, um, we're all very excited to see where it can go in the future and to be able to share it with the rest of the units at the DOT. Thank you. So Jean, from your perspective, you know, what have you heard from feedback and, and what have you had to overcome for advocating for this technology, uh, you know, at Delaware and with the public? Well, I think uh, the secretaries of transportation that <clears throat> I've worked with over the years is they've all been very supportive. The governors have all been supportive, the legislators. Uh, I think it's how you present things and uh, be upfront with how you present things. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, it sort of set us back with AV, how you can demonstrate the vehicles and so forth. But that's as that clears up some, then we'll do more of that. Uh, but I think uh, while I got the floor and Caitlin mentioned it and she's working on it, one of the biggest problems I see, I've been doing this a couple of years, is the knowledge, skill, and abilities of the workforce to do all the functions associated with advanced technology is a problem. It's, uh, we need to really work on training and all of that with every next step we do and plan that as part of the program. couldn't agree anymore. All right, we will finish up with a quick question here. How will you all work to make sure equity is considered with AVs in the future? I'm going to start with Caitlin. Well, I would say um, you know, being a state agency, we are always trying to do things as fairly as possible. 
Um, we employ many different contractors, uh, and I, I'm sure the same will go for automated vehicle manufacturers, um, as well as all the uh, manufacturers for the different products we use. Uh, the RSUs, the OBUs, the um, controllers that we use, we're always looking at all of our options and making sure that we test all the different options and use the ones that best fit the project at hand. So we're definitely trying to hit everything that we want to check off our list uh, and do things as fair as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Nate? Also, it's already Nate. Uh, for us, it, it's what I mentioned before. It's, it's creating this um, committee that will reach out to um, various uh, people that are creating these vehicles, making sure that accessibility is thought of, um, you know, and doing what we can to assist in that thought process um, and making sure that anyone who's using the vehicles going forward can benefit from them. All right, Gene. Uh, I, as they've mentioned, it's sort of built into the way we work and uh, it's just part of because we run a transit system and and uh, all other modes so it's uh it's something that's just part of what a department of transportation does i think what's really going to benefit is and nathan is sort of speaking about it is mobility as a service and this technology will greatly enhance that capability where the vehicle will show up to you depending on your needs it will do what it needs to do to help you with those deeds and so forth so uh the what you're going to see is a whole lot of investment in from companies to for mobility as a service and that's a big benefit out of all of this. all right well thank you for uh, wonderful presentations and very thoughtful discussion to wrap up this this session. Um, we will now exit presentation mode and go back into the conference room mode where you will have the next 15 minutes or 14 minutes, my apologies, uh, to chat with other attendees. When you're ready to move to the next breakout session, go to the directory at the top left of your screen and open the drop down to select the session you would like to attend. Next sessions available for today are the workforce training breakout and the incident management breakout. When you're ready, please choose either of those sessions to attend, and we hope to keep the conversation moving. Thank you, everybody.